Yes, yeah, so a few months ago I had the pleasure of seeing or uh, re-seeing the movie Lawrence of Arabia at the Dryden Theatre. And that movie very clearly shows that the British policy in the Middle East, because the Middle East was at that time during World War I was ruled by the Ottoman Turks. Um, Syria, what is now Syria, uh, Jordan, Iraq, Palestine, and so on. The British policy was, and Lawrence of Arabia took them literally at this, was that they would get the, the, uh, the Arab people to rise up against the Ottoman Turks by promising them that they would have independent nations afterward. The, the, the British generals almost laughed behind Lawrence's back because they knew that that was not what they were going to do. They were going to use what was called the Sykes-Picot Treaty, which was a treaty between Britain, France, and Tsarist Russia to divide up the Ottoman Empire and make different sections of it their own colonies. And he went out and he tried to rally the Arab people against um, the Turks, believing that this was going to happen. They, they promised, or Britain was to take Palestine and Iraq, France was to take Lebanon, Syria, and Lebanon and Syria, and I believe, I mean, I don't know for sure, but Russia was probably going to get what is now Turkey, the Republic of Turkey. Of course, they had the Bolshevik Revolution in between, so they weren't going to turn that over to Lenin. So they created some sort of an independent republic in Turkey to make up for the fact that there was no more Tsarist Russia to give it to. But, and then they promised Palestine would be given to the Zionists to create their state. The Arabs were very upset at what was happening. Um, Lawrence of Arabia was, he was like a slap in the face to him because he had been led to believe that this would happen. The point is, is that they used the Arab uprising against the Turks by, by falsely promising that they would give them independence. And another thing about North Korea is that they always say, well, North Korea's got to give up its nuclear weapons before there will ever be peace in Korea or whatever. But take a look at what they said to Muammar Gaddafi several years ago. Oh, just give up your nuclear weapons, or if you have any, or whatever, your capability of making nuclear weapons. Give that up, and everything's going to be fine. Well, he gave them up. He turned them over. <coughs> the United States and its NATO allies shortly after went right in there and overthrew him and murdered him. So the North Koreans look at that and they say, well, look what happened to Gaddafi when he gave up his nuclear weapons. If we give up our nuclear weapons, how do we know they aren't going to do that to us? It's, it, it's just chicanery on the part of the United States and its imperialist allies in, in both of these areas. They say that Bashar al-Assad, well, he's a dictator. He's a bloodthirsty dictator and all this other crap. I can't even read it anymore. Well, he may be a dictator, but the United States has a history of supporting dictators. Look at Marcos in the Philippines and Suharto in Indonesia and Pinochet in Chile and Arbenz in Guatemala and so on. The only thing is, is that he may be a dictator, but he's a dictator that won't dance to the U.S. tune, and that's the key in this whole situation. I'd like to make a comment about Syria and Bashar Assad, and, um, which is that Syria has protected refugees from all of the um, wars through the, that have rolled through the Middle East. They took in refugees from Palestine, they had more refugees and treated them better than any other uh, country. They took in refugees from Lebanon during the Lebanese Civil War and again in 2006. They took in refugees from Iraq during the Iraq War, many of whom didn't leave until a new war began uh, in Syria. Uh, they have and Mr. Assad has consistently supported protecting these refugees. He has supported the integrity of the Middle East as a regional alliance, and he has uh, supported a secular governance 
that protects all of the uh, minorities within Syria, not at the expense of the Sunni majority. And in fact, one of his major allies is the Grand Mufti, the highest and most respected and revered Sunni in the country. But rather, so that they have a country where all can live in peace. And as Americans, I would think this is something we can relate to very directly since we have a Protestant, uh, basically a Protestant white government that um, our efforts are all directed towards um, having this government protect the rights of minorities and in our country of religious minorities and racial minorities. In the Middle East, in my experience, uh, racial minorities have never been an issue because the, everybody ranges in color there between very dark and very light because it's been a mixing ground of uh, cultures for uh, millennia, not just centuries. And so uh, for them, racism in the sense that we understand it, the United States is literally incomprehensible. Meanwhile, they do have religious uh, differences, but Syria is one of the countries that has most strongly protected the rights of all religious uh, faiths, including Sunnis, including Jews, including all kinds of little splinter groups of Christians that have grown up in the place where Christ was born. And when the United States embarks on these wars of aggression, they consistently put the most violent forces in control rather than the moderate ones because they want someone who will defend their uh, interests. And this is an interesting, just since we talked a little about history, um, the Al-Saud family did govern uh, Arabia for a while in the 19th century, but they spent World War I um, sheltering in Kuwait as the guests of the royal family in Kuwait while the Arashid family um, fought with the British to liberate uh, the Arabs from the Turkmen, uh, from the Ottoman Turks. So uh, at the end of the war, the British supported the Assad's initiative to overthrow uh, the Arashid family and become the government of Saudi Arabia. They did not do that by themselves. And up until that time, there was no Saudi Arabia. There was only Arabia. So there are many ways in which the West has intervened. And the United States really didn't come to the foreground until uh, Great Britain began to fall into the background. Uh, but looking at today, looking at what's happening today, we have to see that this history has created a people here in the United States who have very little understanding of the experiences of the people in countries that the United States has committed aggression against. We have very little understanding of their cultures and not a lot of respect for them because we don't understand them. And if you travel to these places, you learn so many positive things about the people and the cultures that are completely overlooked by the level of discussion supported in this country. And that's one reason why we need to keep all of the marginal areas of discussion. Everyone should continue to be involved and engaged in the discussion of who we are and what we should be doing in this country. I guess I'd like to call on myself to ask a question to all three of the presenters um, in re with regards to what both Judy and Don had said previously. Every time they go to a war, um, the United States, they may not be the only country to do this, they t tend and try to demonize and personalize the, their opponents. And that propaganda, in not so subtle form, is often a sign that um, a country is getting ready for war. So I just wondered if each of the three presenters uh, might like to comment about that. Uh, start with uh, Harry. Yeah. Well, I 
I think you're right that it's a, it's a very commonly used tactic. Um, you certainly saw that with our invasion of Iraq, that the whole media discourse was that we were attacking Saddam Hussein. One, not, not only does it personalize it, but it makes it seem like you're not attacking people, you're just attacking we're just going after Saddam Hussein. And, you know, if 10,000 or 100,000 people die while we're doing it, that's just collateral damage because we're going after one person. It's, um, so it, it, it's, it's, a, it's part of the rhetorical toolkit that our presidents and, and our military, uh, I think, have come to use very, very effectively. I think I think they refined their rhetorical toolkit after after Vietnam when it was pretty clumsy, um, and and they they have honed it very well. Um, and, and so it's incumbent on people who are for peace to to unpack that rhetoric. Judy, would you like to? Oh, I guess I'd like to say that I agree with what they're saying that. Um, this demonization makes it impossible for people to learn what's actually happening because everything is reframed around the behavior of some horrible person. And uh, I think there's a flip side to this which uh, shows up in Palestine where the demon remains uh, Adolf Hitler who died, I don't know, a long time ago before I was born. Uh, and yet we are still protecting a certain group of people in Israel against this demon, Mr. Hitler, uh, who is long gone, and there's nothing in our world, even remotely, uh, like that, uh, from the indigenous people who, again, are disappeared. They say, well, there wasn't anybody here when we arrived, or, well, there, uh, you know, Syria is a, the evil Bashar Assad is a threat to Israel, or the evil Saddam Hussein, or the evil Iranians, they're always a threat, threat to somebody. But um, what you basically have are interests. And uh, the issue uh, that's overridden by this discussion is the fact that American interests are presented in the mainstream government discourse as the only interests that matter. And all other interests uh, are irrelevant or they're evil. But this is obviously, just looking at human nature, an unreasonable explanation of events. And I think uh, Americans, because they don't hear enough of the story, uh, a broad enough discourse, uh, are often um, confused by this uh, tactic and that information uh, and education uh, would go a long ways towards uh, mitigating the capacity of our government to use this tactic to mislead people. I'd like to hear what Lydia has to say. Well, it's a tactic they use and they have used it very successfully. But most of the time, you know, um, the truth is really, really powerful and it does come out. And when the truth comes out, I mean, we, we, we can learn from that and that in itself, uh, like just organizing people. You know, it's, it's very difficult to organize people at this time because they're wars are just going all over in different directions and cropping up. And people, I think especially too in, in the United States, you know, uh, the history of it is, people are very, you know, probably one of the most militant struggles that happen in, in, in particular is in the labor. I mean, you have to say the United States have pretty militant struggles, you know, they, in, in, in regards to labor. But it's just that um, it, it has been, they have been very successful in doing it. And, uh, but they trying to hide the truth when you explain how even in the, in the internet and even the blogs, they've been trying to stop those 
and say that they're fake news, you know. Because eventually, truth does eventually do come out. And that's why they use that tactic. But it hasn't always been um, successful. One thing that the powers that be understand when they're that people that are organizing for whatever anti-war is when what they have learned is not to engage really the United States into a war that is directly involving you know the human, human beings being sent out to war and when they do that's a very dangerous thing for the United States because eventually when you have thousands and thousands of GIs going out to war and when they themselves know that it's it's not just you know something we don't really hear about even though this kind of propaganda coming from the United States government about certain uh, like uh, Kim Jong Il uh, Un, they said, "Oh, he's the helmet, etc. Empire, all that Korean War and the Vietnamese." Uh, a lot of it they demonize, it. but when you send out people to fight a war, literally bringing the military into confrontation, the the rank and file military really understand that what they're doing is wrong. There's been a lot of that in Vietnam which we didn't know. Some of us know because there was an American Servicemen's Union that got organized in Vietnam. And do you know there was a lot of what they call uh, engagement against their military officers because they know that's not a just war. But today, the tactics that, are, that the United States is using is more of a drone war, more high-tech, where it doesn't really involve human beings fighting, you know? And so, that's another aspect of, you know, that they, they know that they, they had taken the equation out there that when body count starts to go up, they know that people are going to really start to organize, you know, against a particular war that they know it's against their interests. That, that's what happened in, in the Vietnam War. When body counts, you remember, many of, maybe many of you weren't that old, but I, I remember seeing body counts come, an airplane would open up their, their airplane and coffins draped in, in uh, the flag, it's just tons and tons of bodies coming out in coffins. And that really, that affects people. That really, and then you have the anti-war going. But today, they have a way of hiding the war. They don't have, it's very high tech using the drones. So it's a lesson for, uh, for you know, we have to be just, just as persistent in trying to fight, you know, these wars, uh, trying to raise the whole idea about the drones, trying to do whatever we can. I, I, I know, uh, but all of this are going to come together eventually. I, I know that's not the, eventually it'll come together because we have a crisis really, uh, a crisis that Besides the, the building of wars, we have an economic crisis really building up in the United States. And those are the crises that <coughs> will bring this into head and we really need to be prepared, you know, uh, to be able to face this. You know, don't be disheartened because we don't have the bourgeois mainstream media here that would be able, but we have our own right now, you know, we have our own the, like independent media and we just continue, just continue to, to organize. True, the demonization is going to be there. It's always going to be there because they feel that it's going to work. But the, the economic crisis in the United States it is, believe me, getting worse and worse. 
and worse. And we don't see it, but I think some of us do. Uh, you, you would see people who are just really working hand to mouth just to survive. And all of this will just come, you know, come together. If you sent GIs to war, <laughs> they know, you know, what their situations are going to be, what their situation at home. You will, you will find there's going to be people resistant to that. And boy, I, I'll tell you, war is a very powerful thing. Uh, it, it really makes people think, it makes people who are fighting them change their mind about the whole issue and say, you know, why am I fighting this war? It changes and it opens their mind to more maybe radical ideas and that, that I, radical ideas is this, why are we sent to war? Who are we fighting for? What, what is it? And so today, you know, um, those are the things that we look forward to, to for people to, to really get educated about that and all these crises will, you know, contradictions and things that come in our society that we realize that. And for people like us who may be in the anti-war movement but also uh, work in community ish, other community issues, one thing that we really should try to do is to connect our issues together because the anti-war issue is really connected to community issues that are fighting racism and that are fighting for housing and that are fighting for, for, for uh, people who are homeless. They're all really connected and it can become a very powerful thing. And just to build on that a little bit, I think from what both of you said, I think although wars often get personalized and, and demonized of individuals, um, I'm, I'm convinced that wars are almost always about resources. They're not really about bad people, they're not really about religion, they're, they're about resources. And the fact is, um, Liz McAllister used to say that the great truths are really pretty simple. And as an academic, I'm supposed to make them complicated. But the truth here is really simple. We live in a capitalist society which demands that we always increase our levels of consumption. Um, unfortunately, we ha also happen to live on a planet which is very large, but it is finite. There are, there are only so many natural resources there, um, particularly fossil fuels. Um, we are already consuming more than the planet can replace in a, in a given year, and we are pushed continually. All nations that are involved in the capitalist system are pushed to increase their levels of consumption. Um, you do the math. It can't, the capitalist system is going to collapse, but in the meantime, the pre the push for resources and the competition for resources that drives wars is going to get more and more intense. Um, the ecological crisis that we find ourselves in is intimately connected to economic inequality, to war, to consumption. And just to pick up a little bit on what you said about drones, um, I think it's not only the fact that we we're turning to drones and automated weapons, not only because we don't want to see American bloodshed when we kill other people, um, but because our leadership realizes that Americans are a small minority of the world's population. And if our military might depends on people, we won't be able to exercise global domination, therefore we need to roboticize it, need to mechanize it if we want America to rule the planet. Um, and that raises some interesting questions about democracy. If our military is moving in that direction, um, do they really believe in that principle of democracy? That's right, it's a good question. Well, to follow up on that, um, think about uh, a, a, an example, which is, again is recently in the news, of Venezuela. Uh, they have 
Well, for a long time, they had de demonized Hugo Chavez, who came to power with a democratic election. election. Now they are demonizing Maduro. And um, as Harry said, though, what is the real question there? Could it be that the United States gets one third of its oil from Venezuela? No, that's just a coincidence. <laughs> Purely a coincidence. Or that Venezuela has the largest oil reserves. known oil reserves of certain types in the entire world. And um, they don't say very much about that. No, they don't. Um, is there anybody else that would like to 